Uh, right now, let's get to that big interview we've been talking about uh, all morning long. Andrew Ross Sorkin is standing by with uh, Marcelo Claré. Hey, Andrew. Hey there. We are uh, at uh, WeWorks' headquarters, and we are with Marcelo Claré. He is the executive chairman of WeWorks. He is also the COO of SoftBank, and this is his first television interview uh, in quite a while since, actually, I think you took this role. And, in, and in fact, I think since you now have a, I've gotten this new CEO in place literally just about a week and a half ago. So thank you for being here. Good to see you again. So much to talk about, uh, given uh, what's happened with WeWork and, and where it's come and where it's going. I think the biggest question on people's minds is how you think you're going to make money doing this. You have 10 plus, maybe 15 with, with debt into this company. I think it's now valued at something on the order of $7.9, $8 billion, at least on the books. At one point, People talked about this as a forty-plus billion-dollar valuation company. How, how how does this work? Just walk us through the math. Okay. First, uh, uh, we work as a sustainable business. We, over the course of the last one hundred days, we've put together a five-year plan that includes basically looking at every single building and and, and putting the financial forecast of every building. And the five-year plan is a great plan. It comes down to execution. And or let me take a step back and let me tell you how we how SoftBank looks at it. First, it's an enormous market. The commercial real estate business is large. Secondly, we have a plan that I'll talk to you about it. We have a fully funded plan, which is quite important. You know, there's sufficient between debt and equity. Pretty much, the plan is funded, and we will have an excess of two and a half to three billion dollars in excess liquidity. And fourth, we have a great new leader. Now, when you ask about WeWork. Basically, our plan calls for us to be profitable by 2021, okay, EBITDA profitable, cash flow positive by 2022, and approximately $1 billion of free cash by 2024. So we have a plan, and now it comes down to execution. We have, we're going to have our first $1 billion quarter in 2020, and we're going to have 1,000 buildings this year. So it's a large business in which scale is a competitive advantage. In terms of the valuation, how do you get back into the money? Well, you get back into the money by, by having a clear plan and start to executing. When you look at 2020, it's a huge inflection point. Pretty much everything is 50% better than last year. And then when you get to 2021, you're EBITDA positive. But, you're but in at, terms of valuation, in terms of multiple, one of the big questions for a company like this is, does it get a tech valuation? Does it get some kind of step up in terms of how it's being valued? Or is it effectively going to get valued like every other real estate company? But this is not a. This is not a, a real estate is an under is an underlying part of our business. But this is a combination of technology, a combination of amazing buildings with great design, as you can see with the, with the community around it. So this is, you know, we, we can never say this is not a real estate business. It has a real it has comp? a real estate component. What's the comp? Well, it depends on the growth. It depends. At the end of the day, all businesses are going to be valued on your ability to generate free cash. I don't care if it's a tech business, a real estate business. And when you have a business today with a clear line of sight that will generate over a billion dollars of free cash, high growth, then I believe this will be a business that will provide a substantial return to our initial investment that SoftBank made. Okay, let me ask you a question. This is uh, from your boss, Masasan. Back in November, he said, in the case of WeWork, I made a mistake. I won't make any excuses. It was a very harsh lesson. What was the lesson for you? What do you think the lesson was for him in terms of the investment and to the extent that you think it went wrong? Maybe the lack of involvement that we had in the business, the complete and open trust to an entrepreneur who did a good job in terms of building a scale business. We're talking about Adam Newman. Yes. Now we are a lot more involved with all of our businesses. We have active board members in, in all of our businesses. So I think that's, you know, that's what I'm, I'm massively referring to the mistake. What, what we're not saying is that this business is a mistake. By no means, this is a great business great business. If you go, this is the only area that hasn't moved to an on-demand uh, business. I mean, today you can order a desk pretty much from your phone. Think about it. Other ways you can go to an office building, they're going to ask you to sign a five-year lease. You're going to have to get a builder, a contractor, and all that. Today you can go to your phone, you can go to an app, and you can sign a three-month, a six-month, a one-year lease. So this was the last part of the world in which the on-demand economy really has, hasn't had an effect. And today, I mean, you can see the growth. There's very few businesses in the world, I was saying in, the, in, in, this type of a, in this type of business, where we've grown from 200 buildings in 2017. At the end of this year, we're going to have over 1,000 buildings. And these are large buildings. They house 1,000 people. So therefore, uh, I mean, it's a great business. It's high growth. Our customers love it. It has a great brand. 
So I could not be more positive in the future of WeWork. You talk to Adam Newman? Rarely. Rarely? Yeah. Not, not that much anymore? I mean, you know, Adam calls and right. he, he gives us his opinion. And what does he think of all of this? Oh, I, I think he's very excited. He's very excited that the, build, the business is transitioning from, you know, a high growth uh, to a more, I would say, more disciplined business with accountability and with a more mature leadership. I know you've been asked this a lot, especially by employees in this company, but just speak to it. I know you've tried to speak to it before. The idea of Adam effectively walking away with more than a billion dollars after what felt like uh, a, a massive failure in terms of the larger valuation of this company during the IPO process. Okay. So let's start by saying that Adam hasn't walked away with over a billion dollars. There's a tender ongoing right now in which Adam will have the right to participate as other shareholders. Adam is a large shareholder of the company. He was the founder. And as we do a tender to buy shares from other shareholders, he's going to have the same opportunity as any other shareholder. But to say that Adam has walked away with over a billion dollars is totally false. Do you think you could have cut a different or better deal so that he, at least optically, these questions wouldn't exist? I mean, I think it's, it's easy to go back and say, what would a deal be like? What we're saying is SoftBank expressed an interest in owning a larger part of, a SoftBank, of a WeWork, right. and Adam is a large shareholder. So as you do a tender to buy shares, he has an option to participate. We have no idea how much he plans to sell, and that's why people speculate of how much he can potentially walk away with. But Adam had not walked away with a billion dollars. Uh, you just hired a new CEO, uh, okay. comes from the real estate world. Does that change the culture of WeWork? Because, and this goes to, is this a tech company? Is this a real estate company? Is this something else? Okay. First, we hired a leader, right? A great leader who's probably done one of the most amazing turnarounds in the retail industry, GGP, right. which, as you know, he took it from bankruptcy and sold it for tens of billions of dollars to Brookfield. That was a transformational leader. The company has a great culture. And uh, there was a lot that had to do, a lot of innovation in order to transform that retail business. It is a very similar play here. So we got to get away from the tech. Is it a tech business? Is it a real estate business? WeWork has its own space. It's a unique company. But part it's a of space it is as the a special service. sauce of something that, that elevates it be, to the extent that it's not a real estate business. There was this sort of special cultural sauce that was layered on top that actually created that excitement and to the extent it created a higher valuation, no? I mean, the excitement doesn't change. All you have to do is go to a WeWork building, and when you find the combination of amazing real estate with amazing design, with technology, and with community, that's a special place for WeWork. Right. It is not your traditional real estate that you are renting an empty box and then right. you design it yourself. This is a service company in which you're walking in, you walk, and you have all the services available for you as a member to focus on doing your job and then let everything else right. be served by WeWork. Long term, you can have more leases. You can have other people. You're going to be servicing other people's leases. How, does, how do you think this? What do you think this looks like? Combination of many. I mean, first we have a thousand leases. There's nobody in the world that has a thousand leases today, all over the world, in 140 cities, you know, I think over 37 countries. The scale. You allow. You can be a WeWork member right. in Boston and then be able to work in 140 cities. But you want to have world. less leases over time. Not necessarily. We got to we got to make sure that we onboard these buildings, that the 1,000 buildings that we have are profitable, are doing a good job, and then we're going to continue to grow in different facets. We might do more management deals. We're talking about potentially doing franchising, and we're going to continue to open new buildings in great cities. The same type of business that we have, but the sustainable business is solid. It is a business that generates cash, and it's a business that's profitable. Uh, coronavirus. Uh, you have a number, actually, I think 100 different WeWorks in China. What's happening right now? Well, we, we are being first wanted to make sure that no members and no employees are infected. And that's great. That's a great win. We've been following the guidelines of the Chinese government. We have closed, we have temporarily closed 100 buildings that we're monitoring and working right. with the Chinese government to make sure that we're following the appropriate guidelines. So that's contained for us. But obviously, it's an area of concern. I mean, having 100 buildings closed with members not having access to and just working with emergency personnel, it's an issue. Um, let me ask you about SoftBank. Sure. And specifically, the second vision fund. Uh, there have been reports that it has been very hard to raise new money for that fund, and that instead of a $108 billion fund, it might come in at half of that, and that a majority of that money is ultimately going to be soft bank money, not outside investor money. What can you say about 
the state of, of, of that fundraising effort? So one is too early, right? I mean, uh, you've got to put things in perspective. We just finished Vision Fund 1. That was $100 billion, two years. Had never been done. So now as this fund starts to finish, then we're looking at how we're going to do in Vision Fund 2. Uh, obviously, performance is key, and, and Vision Fund 1 performance, once you start getting away from the media and the craziness and all that, you know, the fund is performing well. You know, we, we've had a lot of complaints about Uber. Well, Uber is up, I think, 18 percent from what we invested. We've had complaints against WeWork. We feel very good that we have a great plan for WeWork. So I think as, as things start to come down and you start seeing that Uber was a good investment, right sharing has an incredible amount of potential, that WeWork has a plan and we start executing quarter over quarter, you're going to see that potentially, you know, the additional vision fund, you know, are going to come along. But you know, you know we're long term thinkers and. Uh, when we launched the first $100 billion fund, it was supposed to last five years. So but we've accelerated that. Do you think that the that. strategy is shifting? Do you think there's a major strategy shift in terms of SoftBank and Moss's own thinking in terms of growth at any cost versus trying to get to profitability much quicker and what that ultimately means? And also means, by the way, about the sort of outsized valuations that I think he's thought about as a long-term investor. I, mean, I don't think it's never been growth at any cost. I think that's a misconception. You know, we like accelerated growth. We like companies that can take, you know, a lot of market share. And we like companies that have a clear path to profitability and cash flow, just like any other investment. you got to look at the entire track record of SoftBank, right? And but you gotta, and but you there have been conversations over the past couple of months with portfolio companies that have said, okay, guys, I know, I know we said put your foot on, the, foot on the gas, but maybe we got to put our foot on the brake, right? I wouldn't call it the brake. I would say you decelerate. There are different times. But again, I mean, nothing has changed in terms of we believe – that there are certain companies and certain entrepreneurs that have developed unique business models that you get to accelerate the growth. It happened with Alibaba, happens with Yahoo Japan, it happened with many of our companies. What, what I think is, uh, you know, the, what I, I think we're a little confused is everybody's saying, oh my God, this vision fund uh, performance is terrible. It's not. By the way, it's great. You know, you've had eight IPOs. You've, the, re, the value that has been uh, generated, half of it is realized. Most other funds, the value is, is still on paper. We've returned money to our LPs. And at the same time, the two big criticisms of the Vision Fund has been what? Uber. Well, guess what? You're following Uber. Uber is up over our investment, and we have a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of good views on what's going to happen to Uber. And the second was WeWork, and now after 100 days, we have a very clear plan on how to take WeWork to well, profitability. What about this idea of paper-based valuations? Because part of the issue, frankly, with WeWork was the idea that effectively there was this artificial valuation of $47 billion, in part because SoftBank put money in after its own money. And so how accurate are all of the, are all of the marks in the, in the SoftBank funds? Oh, they're very accurate. I mean, you have to look at, you know, funds are going to move up and down in value in many cases. The only difference is because we're a publicly traded company, we get to report on that. I mean, most funds don't have the problem. They have to report on a quarterly basis on, on, on what is happening to their, to their markups and all that. I think we are conservative today. I think, you know, every valuation is done by an independent third party, by one of the big five, and they're based on the traditional methodology in which you value companies in future, in discounted cash flow and others. So I, I don't think it's a fair way to look at it. Of course, there are going to be some investments that are great and some that are not so great. But again, I go back and I say, focus on what has been the criticism, Uber and WeWork. Those have been the two that everybody has talked about, and we feel incredibly comfortable of both. Paul Singer, Elliott Management. Um, Longtime activist. He's gotten into a lot of companies over the years and he's pushed people around. Um, what is the relationship like now between Elliott and SoftBank now that he has a stake in that company and is calling for changes? Start. I mean, we, we, we have our own activist. It's called Massa, who's continuously looking for ways to make this business better. And we, since we said since day one, you know, a, any shareholder that has views. We're always going to listen. We know Massa is a pretty open person. The management team of, of SoftBank is open. And we're always going to listen to suggestions because we're all in the same, you know, we're on the same boat. We all want to make sure that we can generate but, but our, shareholder but value. But are buybacks and, and financial engineering things that Massa wants to, wants to pursue? I think it depends. I mean, if you go back last year, we did a large stock right. buyback. And it depends. Isn't that antithetical, though, to his idea about making long-term investments? I think it depends on the situation. By no means are we saying we're going to do something we're right. not. There's a new shareholder who basically has some views. We will take his views. We will discuss their views. And we will, right. we will like we do it with any other shareholder. Final question uh, on Sprint. You, you, have, you wear multiple hats. 
Uh, the Sprint T-Mobile deal, uh, we're still waiting on the judge. When do you think we're going to hear? So it's been two years, and first is thank you to all my employees at Sprint for their incredible resilience through this time. Uh, it's up to the judge. Right now, he has all he needs to make a, a decision. We expect the decision to come any time, but there again, he can take his time. So we hope in the next couple of weeks, a few weeks, we're going to have a decision. And based on the merits of the merger, nothing has changed. We believe that this is the best for U.S., for consumers, and for competition. Okay. Marcelo Clark, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great to see you. Yeah.